I want to start with the same two naive questions uh, that I asked, that I suggested that you ought to ask if you were interested in the course. Um, so start with the first one. Why is it worth spending a whole semester on Greek tragedy? Greek tragedy is odd. It's not really like what we think of as drama. Uh, and it's, it differs in a bunch of ways. Um, at most, it's performed by at most three actors. Uh, in Aeschylus, it's two, and then it gradually shifts to three. It's, if you've read any, you know that there are more than two roles, and therefore, you know that they play multiple roles. Playwrights sometimes use this. So, for example, in Sophocles' play, The Philoctetes, at the very end of the play, this demigod, Heracles, is supposed to come on, and it's part of what uh, gets the name, the deus ex machina, the god from the machine. Um, the god comes on, Heracles comes on, and solves the problems that have been raised in the play. Now, the interesting thing about the Philoctetes is that there are um, three people in the play, plus a couple of bit parts. But mostly, you've got Odysseus, Philoctetes, and Achilles' son, Neoptolemus. Odysseus, here as elsewhere in Greek tragedy, is a very cagey, sort of sly man. And so he's trying to get Philoctetes to go to Troy with him so that um, back to Troy, they're in the 10th year of the war, so that they can finally end this thing. There's an oracle that says, not until Philoctetes comes with his bow will they be able to um, prevail over the Trojans. So he's trying to get Philoctetes to come. I didn't mean to do any of this, but it's a beautiful story. It's sort of the limit case of Greek tragedy. Uh, Philoctetes is a man who, as a tragic hero, is tragic because he has an unhealing wound that is incredibly stinky. And, and he, he wails all the time because it hurts so much. So they're on the way to Troy, and they just can't stand it anymore. And they drop him off on the Isle of Lemnos um, and leave him there uh, for 10 years in the war. And then, because he smelled so bad, and then they come back and realize, I mean, they, hear, they get this oracle. They need his bow, so they come back and um, it's Odysseus's job to try to convince Philoctetes to come to Troy with him voluntarily after they abandon him on this island. So it's a tricky business. And you watch Odysseus use all sorts of uh, indirect ways of trying to trick Philoctetes. So it wouldn't be surprising if he somehow came in and faked being Heracles at the end of the play. And given the fact that there are only three actors, it's the same actor. So there's a long scholarly debate about whether it's really Odysseus, whether it's really, uh, Philo I'm sorry, whether it's really Heracles at the end, or it's meant to be, you're meant to take it Odysseus as Odysseus in disguise. And the interesting thing, is, of course, is that the way Greek drama um, is limited by three actors, there's a way in which you can't know. So Sophocles takes advantage of the fact that there are only uh, three actors uh, in the play. Um, these actors wore elaborate masks. Uh, one expression on the mask, obviously they couldn't change it. And they wore, we think, elevated shoes. They did the performance before probably 30,000 people. Um, regularly a full house because they didn't do them that often. We think that it included uh, women and slaves, which by itself would be unusual in Greece for men and women publicly to be in the same place outside in such large numbers. Um, the acoustics in the theaters, there's one in uh, Epidaurus um, pretty much intact where it's as though if you drop a pin on the stage, you can hear it in the last row. They worked out the acoustics so well. Um, Greek tragedy isn't realistic. 
So in the first scene of Antigone, you have Antigone sort of running around in the open and meeting Ismene. She's just uh, buried her against the, the edict of Creon. She just buried her brother. But of course, um, in contemporary Athens, where this play would have been performed, um, women of Antigone's class weren't allowed out in public uh, by themselves in that way. Um, maybe the strongest, the strangest feature is the chorus. For tragedy, initially you had 12 and then later 15. For comedy, it was 24. Um, the chorus, and you'll watch me over the course of this semester, move between singular verb and plural verb because in a way the chorus is weird. It really is both simultaneously. Um, the chorus is or are both an actor in the play with peculiar characteristics. So for example, in our first play, the Agamemnon, uh, the chorus will be a chorus of 12 old men who were already too old 10 years ago when the Trojan War started uh, to go to war. Um, so they're both a character with distinctive characteristics, old men, captive women, and so on. And at the same time, a spectator, a commentator on the action, on what takes place in the play. This chorus sing odes in, they're called stasima. Um, they sing them when the other, when the actors have left the stage. They sing in one dialect, Doric, and they speak in another dialect, Ionic. As they sing, they also dance in the orchestra, which is a circular area in front of what's called the skene. Um, our word for scene derives from it. Uh, the whole play is in poetry. It's metrical. The complicated meters uh, are not like ours. Our meter is based on stress. Shall I compare the two a summer's day, iambic pentameter? Um, Greek meter is ba based on syllable length. So if you know anything about the Greek alphabet, you know that you have this in caps and this. This is called an omega. And this is called an omicron. But an omega just means big O. And omicron means little o. Big O because it takes longer to say it. It's stretched out more uh, in time. Um, when consonants cluster together in Greek, that extends the length of, this, of the syllable. So th there are meters based not on stress, but based on length. Um, standard examples that in a way correspond to ours, the iamb, the da, uh, the troche. So the iamb is short long, the troche is long short, uh, the dactyl, it's a word for finger, so you can guess what it is, right? Long, short, short. That's why they do it that way. Um, so those are not really different. We also have the, the anapest, short, short, long. That somehow corresponds to what we have, but they have, you know, I don't even name them all. The dokmiak, the hoopadokmiak, Duckmiak is short, long, long, short, long. The hoopadokmiak is long, short, long, short, long. So when you stretch things, these things out, you have extraordinarily complicated metrical systems. Now, Greek words are different from, in, in antiquity, from what our words are like, what modern European languages especially are like. Um, they're accented tonally. So when I first learned Greek 
many, many years ago, um, they were beginning an experiment it, where I went to graduate school. They knew that Greek was tonally accented. They knew that it had three accents, acute, grave, circumflex, one ascending, one descending, and one ascending and then descending. Um, it had been the habit forever, at least since the time of Erasmus, to just forget about all that and translate it as though you were translating a, read it as though you're reading a, a language where stress was important and not tone. So these people very imaginatively invented what they thought Greek might have uh, sounded like. And I remember still, uh, they made us memorize dialogues in Greek and the, first line of Plato's Euthyphro on their system, I don't think it sounded anything like this, but on their system would have gone something like this. Diati o Socrates, su in tada nun peritain stoan. So it's not, that's not the way it was, but once you hear that, you understand that however it was, it was in some way different from our way of stressing uh, words. Our, it was different, their meter and their accent different radically uh, from ours. Um, it must have then been very difficult to distinguish since all of these, in the chorus especially, since the choruses were sung, it must have been extremely difficult to distinguish the tones of the tunes from the tones of the language itself. How do you take a language that, that is what it is by virtue of its intonation and turn it into, and, and that means rising, descending, rising and descending. How do you do that and then mix it together with a tune that varies in terms of, uh, in terms of certain notes? Now, I mention all of this not because I think it's important for you to remember it, but to give you a sense of just how strange, by our standards, Greek tragedy really is. Well, okay, at least it lasted for a long time, right? I mean, it's, a, it's so, it's 2,500 years old, but it, it lasted forever, so it must have been important. Well, actually, no, it lasted for 100 years, roughly from 500 to 400 BC, um, roughly the length of one man's life. Sophocles lived over that period. Um, incidentally and interestingly, that's also the hundred years in which Greek, in, in which Athenian democracy um, existed. Um, well, if not for a long time, at least it was widespread, right? No. Um, in fact, Greek tragedy uh, was largely restricted to Athens and to the area around Athens, which in which Athens finds itself, which is called Attica. Hence, we talk about Attic tragedy. Um, in fact, there are, we have 32 Greek tragedies complete. I, I, 12, I think, Aeschylus and Sophocles, and 17 by, is that 32? Anyway, I haven't got it quite right. Euripides is the rest of them. Um, so we have 32, and all of them were performed for the first time, and it's interesting, we think they were actually only performed once in these tragic festivals, in one theater, the Theater of Dionysus on the slope of the Acropolis. So um, not for a long time, not particularly widespread. Um, what have we got then? We're gonna spend a whole semester on a strange literary form practiced 2,500 years ago for a short time in a single theater in a city with a population less than Yonkers. So why? Why is, why is this worth doing? I mean, it's a sort of historical curiosity, but I don't know about you, but I, I'm not interested in that. I mean, there's it's gotta be more to it than that. 
If it were an historical curiosity, well, then you'd watch a special on TV on it and say, oh, isn't that interesting? And then let it fly out of your mind immediately. But you wouldn't spend a whole semester on it. So why? Um, let's turn to the second naive question. Maybe we'll have better luck. Why do we do it in a philosophy course? Why is this course called the philosophy of tragedy? I have a note here that I'm supposed to read a passage from Friedrich Nietzsche's philosophy in the tragic age of the Greeks. And naturally, I left it at home on my desk, so I can't read it. <laughs> but it's the pas passage, a passage that says, uh, every philosopher, every great philosopher uh, has one great thought, and it's always an error. But it's a magnificent error, as opposed to you know, a sort of trivial truth. Um, so philosophy involves a great error. When Nietzsche uses that phrase, he knows and this is in a book called Philosophy in the Tragic Age of the Greeks. Nietzsche was, uh, was educated and taught in the university as a philologist, as, a, as someone who was an expert in the languages and literature of antiquity. He knows that when he says one great error, uh, he's using a phrase. He, if he translated it into Greek, he would have the word hamartia which is supposed to be the fundamental characteristic of all tragedy, the hamartia of the tragic hero, according to Aristotle. So what does that mean? Um, why is it the case that philosophy is always grounded in a great error? There's a tension between, the, this in a way is a, is a uh, much too quick account of something that occurs in Nietzsche's book, The Birth of Tragedy. Um, there's a tension between the assumption that the world ultimately makes sense. That would be the motive for a serious question, right? The motive for philosophy, um, it's always, uh, Seems strange to me. There's a lecture, so you don't talk back, not in the first day anyway. <laughs> but in a seminar, it's always seems strange to me. Students come in and, or in the interviewing before, the interviewing for a, um, uh, a, a seminar, and students say, you know, I really like philosophy because uh, there are no answers. And most of the time, I just let it pass. And sometimes I can't bear it. And I say, what? I mean, why would you, why would you get involved with it if there, weren't any, if there are no answers? Why do you ask the question if you know from the beginning there are, there are no answers? It looks as though a serious question can only be asked seriously if you honestly want the answer. If you decide in advance that there are, is no answer, then you're just kind of playing around. It's not, it's not serious. It's just, you know, it's the equivalent of, I don't know, reading a, a you know, mystery novel or taking a long hot bath or something. But that mm -hmm. philosophy is not supposed to be that. It's supposed to be the most important thing in the world once you understand what's going on. So, so the assumption underlying philosophy seems to be that however difficult these fundamental questions admit of the possibility <laughs> of answers. Now, um, that means that ultimately, the assumption is that we live in a world that in principle makes sense, even if it doesn't make sense initially or to each of us individually. There's a tension then between the assumption that ultimately the world makes sense, and the tragic sense of life, according to which 
for Nietzsche at least, at the heart of things, there is a kind of chaos. So philosophy for Nietzsche is not so much love of wisdom as a willful imposition of order that's unaware of its own willfulness. In a famous phrase, he says, philosophy is simply the most spiritualized form of the will to power. So at least at first, and one has to emphasize that enormously, at first, for Nietzsche, Greek tragedy seems deeply, deeply anti-philosophic. Now, he's very smart and never simply wrong. Um, actually, it, you ought to forgive my digressions, but um, one of the easy mistakes we make is thinking that any opinion, so it's one thing to, to think, and a foolish thing, I think, to think that all opinions are equally valid and it doesn't matter what you think as long as you're sincere. Um, all of that makes intellectual life really very frivolous if there's no place to go um, on the one hand. On the other hand, it's equally foolish to think that um, any opinion is ever simply false. Because even the most preposterous opinions come from somewhere. They're grounded in something. So it's foolish to think that you can simply dismiss them because you, in order to dismiss them, you have to try to think through why would someone say that? What's that? What, would, what are the grounds for believing it, such a thing? That's, and this really is digressive, but that's the secret of reading Plato. 35 dialogues in which Plato presents conversations between Socrates and some pretty strange people uh, with some pretty strange opinions. But in fact, what you learn is none of these opinions is simply wrong. Every one of these opinions is somehow grounded in something that's true. And the goal in a Platonic dialogue is to try to figure out what it is that grounds these opinions. Where do they come from? Um, so let's start from the obvious. Tragedy isn't about laughter. It's about sadness. It's about tears. You might enjoy it. That by itself is a little peculiar. Think of Act 5 of Hamlet. Um, last act. End of the act, end of the play, everybody's dead except for Horatio. And what happens? It's over, the curtain you know, closes, applause, bravo, wonderful. What's going on there? You've just watched all these people die, and you somehow move to applause. You've, you've, it's magnificent. And it's not just because you know, you enjoy the spectacle, it's because something's gone on that moves you deeply, and yet it's something, it's something in a way awful that's gone on. Um, so you enjoy, you may enjoy tragedy, but there's no way that you chuckle through it. You don't say, oh, wow, this is amusing. Um, still, not every sadness, regardless of what you hear on the evening news, not every sad thing is tragic. Somehow to be tragic, the sadness has to be inescapable. For example, not simply due to a lack of judgment, not just because somebody did a stupid thing. That's not tragic. So tragedy seems to stand or fall depending on whether there are problems, questions, that can't be solved, that can't be answered. There's a wonderful story. It's almost certainly apocryphal, uh, told by a, an ancient historian, pagan historian, named Zosimos. Um, according to Zosimos, the emperor of Rome, Constantine, murders his son, Crispus, because Constantine suspects that he's been 
sleeping with his stepmother, Fausta. Um, so, so far, this is the story of Euripides' play Hippolytus. Now, he's, he kills his son. Constantine's mother, Helen, Crispus's grandmother, is rather upset by the fact that her son, her grandson, has been killed. So to make it up to her, Constantine has Fausta, his wife, burned up in her bath. Um, then he wor he's worried over what he's done and asks his priests for rites that will purify him. And they say, that's quite impossible. You know, you can't, some things you can't be purified for. But there's an Egyptian from Spain in Constantine's court who tells him about a religion that offers absolution from any crime. It's Christianity. Accordingly, Constantine converts, and with him the whole Roman Empire, and the history of the world is changed. Now, you see why I called it apocryphal. This isn't true. Um, but it's revealing because in, its, in, in the way it proceeds, it calls into question the very possibility of a Christian tragedy. This, if nothing is beyond expiation, how can there be tragedy? Where no problem is beyond solution. So, you know, Oedipus should go to counseling after he kills his father and sleeps with his mother. Agamemnon and Clytemnestra should go to a marriage counselor to work out their differences. So the assumption somehow that all differences can be worked out in this way assumes that, you know, there's no reason for, there, there's nothing, nothing is beyond expiation. So, tragedy is impossible. On the other hand, where problems are incapable of resolution, this suggests that there is something irrational at the core of things. And so Nietzsche is somehow right. There's a tension between the worlds of tragedy and the worlds of philosophy. We're in deep here because it's very unclear what a course called the philosophy of tragedy would then uh, do with itself. So let's start over. Um, the paradigmatic tragedy, even in the fifth century, was Sophocles, Oedipus Tyrannus, the Oedipus the king. Uh, Aristotle in the Poetics mentions it nine times, twice as often as the next, as the runner up, if it's an eye among the Torians. All others he mentions only once. There are versions of this play by Seneca, by Corneille, by Dryden, by Voltaire, by Gide, not to mention Aeschylus and Euripides, although they don't exist any longer. We know that they wrote them. And of course, there's Freud. So the Oedipus Tyrannus seems to exemplify the expression that the first chorus in Agamemnon use, pathe mathos, the tragic dictum, learning through suffering. Now, Oedipus' problem is roughly thinking that he can take matters into his own hands. So he hears a drunk in what he thinks, Oedipus thinks is his home city of Corinth. Um, the drunk questions his parentage. Oedipus goes to Delphi, where the oracle tells him he's going to kill his father and marry his mother. And so he runs away from Corinth because he's a good son. He believes enough to leave, but not enough to believe. And we know what happens. So Oedipus's attempt to take control leads to his losing control. He suffers and learns. Pathe mathos. That is, he blinds himself and goes into exile suitably chastened. And then he moves on to the next play, the Oedipus of Colonus. 
So Oedipus learns that human beings can't be autonomous. They can't be utterly responsible for themselves. They can't be self-caused. They can't be their own parents or generators. Now, contrary to Nietzsche, this seems to suggest a kind of rationalism, albeit learned through hard experience. You know, it's not as though he's, 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 it, he's so rational that he knows from the beginning what to do and what not to do, but it, over the course of the play, he learns about the mistake he's made. Um, and if wisdom is possible and very desirable, then philosophy understood as the love of wisdom or the pursuit of wisdom is surely necessary. Sophocles, though, won't let it go at this. We talked a little bit about this in the group interview, that the Oedipus who has just discovered that um, uh, he's made this terrible error, thinking that he could control his fate so fully, um, learns it at the moment, learns it deeply, presumably at the moment when he uh, he discovers that his mother wife has uh, commit su committed suicide. When he sees her hanging there and takes from her uh, her cloak the roaches that hold it together and sticks them in his eyes and blinds himself. Now I mentioned this before to you, it's a rather wonderful piece of Sophoclean poetry that the tra every translation, in order to make sense of it for you, will say that he stabs himself in the eyes, but actually the word that is used means something like sockets, stabs himself in the arthra. Our word arthritis comes from it. It's a joint, it's a ball joint. Um, and it's the same word that was used previously to describe what happened to Oedipus when he was a little baby, and he was stabbed through we take it to be his ankles or his legs or his knees, we're never quite sure, but it's a ball joint. It's through his arthra, um, plural, ball joints. Uh, so it turns out that after he stabs himself in the eyes, he walks out of the house and tells Creon, I've been terrible, you really need to take the rule and um, exile me to Mount Kitharon outside of Thebes. Well, of course, the baby Oedipus was stabbed through the ball joints, the arthra, and put out on Mount Kitharon. So Sophocles is hinting to us that this man who has just discovered what he did wrong, trying to be the sole cause of his own fate, assuming that he could be that, is once again doing the same thing by prescribing his own punishment. This is what I did, I should be punished, this is how I should be punished. He's taking control of the world again and thinking that he's in utter control uh, of, his, of his own fate. So it turns out then that he never learns, even after all his suffering. So tragedy then, if this is where the, the play is headed and this is the paradigmatic tragedy, um, it looks as though tragi tragedy ultimately implies a sad reality, and Nietzsche was right. There's a chaos at the core of reality. Yet, we learn, if we're paying attention, that Oedipus doesn't learn. We even learn why he doesn't learn. And so it looks as though at a still deeper level, read in the way we'll try to read the tragedies this semester, tragedies do seem to make sense of the world. Tragedy itself somehow detaches us enough from the world to teach us exactly how it's impossible to be detached from the world. So you remember, I pointed out to you that in the play, Oedipus, the king, every time he talks about where the killing of his father occurred, he says it is at a parting of three ways. And every time anybody else talks about it, 
they talk about it as a fork in the road. The interesting thing about the difference is that everybody else, without even thinking about it, understands that you only get to the point where the road forks by having come along another road. You can't be what you are without having a past. You can't, uh, forgive me for using the same example, but it's so wonderful uh, that I can't resist. Uh, um, if you think about the standard teenage lament, um, I wish you weren't my parents. When you're in a fight with your parents, you realize by, by realizing how crazy that is, you realize why so what Sophocles has in mind. Um, if your only defense is against your parents when you're at odds with them is to say, I wish I, you weren't my parents. That's like saying, I wish I weren't born because you wouldn't be there if, unless you had these parents. You are what you are by virtue of the path you've walked down, except if you're Oedipus, you somehow treat it as though you're not, as though you could hover above and choose any of the three ways that you're not constituted by already having come down one of them. And the beautiful thing about it is, this is of course the, the, the source of Oedipus's problem, the assumption that he is self-caused, the assumption that, that he's autonomous. Um, it's the assumption he begins the play with. It's, the, it's what he shows at the end, despite what he's seen and the, the horror that he's seen, he still hasn't learned. Um, and so it's interesting that Sophocles poses these two for us as alternatives. And yet, when you think about it for a minute, you realize Sophocles has made us hover above and see things that in a certain way we shouldn't be able to see if the second way is the only way. So we learn that Oedipus doesn't learn and why he doesn't learn. If we learn that, it looks as though at some still deeper level, Tragedies make sense of the world. Tragedy itself detaches us enough from the world to teach us exactly how it's impossible to be detached from the world. It's in that way deeply philosophic. Now, how exactly detachment of this sort is possible, it's still a mystery. And for this reason, tragedy turns out to be deeply self-reflexive. Uh, it's not only about what it's about, it's about itself. It's about it, how it's possible to do what it's doing. And so as self-reflexive, in this way, it is also deeply philosophic. What's interesting is that, for me interesting, and I'll force it to be interesting, for you by the end of the semester, um, is the way this is a model for the Socratic philosophy of Plato and Aristotle. Philosophy understood as somehow figuring out the limits of certain ways of looking at things, of common opinions, of orthodoxy, right opinion, of ideology, which while not giving us an absolute knowledge of the way things are, nevertheless reveals to us certain things about the way things are. Pathemathos. Pathemathos is a tragic version of knowledge of ignorance. And the interesting thing, some of you have read Plato, um, the temptation when you hear Socrates say, all I know is that I do not know, is to think, oh, how humble. And he's really just saying, well, you can't know anything, can you? Um, but in fact, he doesn't say that. He says he has knowledge of the fact that he doesn't know. That's a lot of knowledge. Knowing that and why you don't know something 
teaches you something actually rather powerful and important about your world. It's a little bit like what I talked about earlier. It's a little, little bit like realizing that everybody has an opinion about the way things are. We're clever enough to figure out that most people haven't thought through their opinions, and so they're likely not to be true. But they never come from nothing. And so figuring out where they come from, even though they turn out to be false, gives you a rather interesting perspective on the character of the world in which you live. So one example. Um, Some of you have either read or heard about this famous passage in Plato's Republic in the seventh book, the cave image. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. But the key is somehow the notion that we're locked in a world of appearance, or doxa also means opinion. And that the goal of philosophy is to turn that opinion into knowledge. God, they don't, this is not good. Should I write knowledge in red? Into knowledge. Um, opinion is based in seeming, knowledge is based in being. The goal seems to be to get past seeming and live in the realm of being. The difficulty, and Plato's full well aware of this, is that if you ask yourself what the character of the real being of things is, it's this. It's not that. The way things seem and why they seem that way is part of the way things are. So when Socrates claims to have knowledge of ignorance, that knowledge of ignorance is in a way a knowledge of why seeming is just seeming. But that's a very big part of an awareness of the way things are, how things really are. Um, so this is, by the way, just the principle of all fiction. You know the first line of Tolstoy's Anna Karenina? All happy families are alike. Every unhappy family is, un, is unhappy in its own way. Um, well, try to invent for yourself a novel that has to do with a happy family. What on earth would it be? I mean, there are no problems. There's nothing at, at every stage. They're, they're happy. It turns out to understand what it means to write means to write about a problem of some kind. You can't imagine what it would be to be interested in a plot that isn't grounded in something that looks problematic, which in either works its way out or doesn't work its way out. But you can't, I mean, I once did it in this way. Uh, excuse the, the simple-minded way in which it comes out, but that's useful too. So once upon a time, there was a boy and a girl. And the boy and the girl lived next door, and they liked each other very much. And um, they went to school. And as they worked through school, uh, they each became the co-valedictorians of their class. And they were also very attractive. Uh, everybody agreed. and the best in sports and in theater, and you know you can add the details yourselves. When they um, 
got to be juniors. They got 800s on all their SATs, and they both went to uh, Harvard together, or if you'd prefer, they went to Sarah Lawrence together. You can write it any way you want to. And then uh, they, uh, at a certain point, entered their careers and were phenomenally successful and had no problems at all. And then um, they decided to have children. Uh, let's call them uh, the parents, Dick and Jane, and the children, Dick Jr. and Jane Jr. And they, um, and they were, and their children were just absolutely gorgeous and destined for greatness. Um, so that's what the perfectly happy novel, I mean, if you don't figure out that this doesn't make anybody happy, but if you just use it in, in the spirit it's offered, uh, it's what the perfectly happy novel would look like. You could say you don't understand anything if you understand the world in that way. Yeah. If you make a choice, you're confronted with alternatives. You're confronted with, I mean, you can imagine a lot of ways in which a story would work that out. As the reader, you might be reading it and say, no, don't choose that way because that's bad and you're a fool if you choose. So you could make the wrong choice or you could be in a situation where you feel as though you have to make a choice and because you live a finite life, you can't do both things but you recognize that both are worth doing and that hurts you. So you can work it out in a bunch of different ways, but if the choice doesn't involve a difficulty, a genuine difficulty, a problem, then it doesn't look as though it, um, it means anything to us. It looks as though it's not really even a choice because when choosing is obvious and you just choose the, the best way and there are no bad consequences of it, who cares about that? It's not, it's not interesting. So it turns out that for things to be interesting, they have to be hard. Pathé mathos. We learn through suffering, but they have to learn through suffering too. It doesn't mean they can't come out in a good story on the right side. I like stories like that sometimes. Um, but it does mean that uh, the family that's destined to be happy from the beginning is two things, on the way uninteresting, on the one hand uninteresting, on the other hand impossible, given, given the way we're put together. Um, so let's go back to our first naive question question about the importance of tragedy and the reason for spending a semester on it. This has to do with its powerful, it has to do with the second question. It has to do with this powerful, if complicated, connection between philosophy and tragedy. Now tragedy is obviously not about philosophy. So let's pull back for a second and ask a simpler question. What's it obviously Greek tragedy, really most tragedy until the pretty modern era, um, what's it obviously about? So think Shakespeare, King Lear, King Macbeth, Prince Hamlet, General Othello, and down the list. Um, it looks like it's about politics in the broadest sense. And yet, by 500 BC, when the great age of Greek tragedy begins, um, the word king, basileos, in Attic Greek, um, already is a name for a minor functionary in democratic Athens. It doesn't mean king any longer. Um, still, for some reason, political rule, the city, the polis, is all over Greek tragedy as an issue. Now, so it's about politics on the one hand. On the other hand, of the 32 extant Greek tragedies, 30 of them, excluding Euripides' Rhesus and Aeschylus' Prometheus Bound, um, turn to some extent on family ties. 
So politics and family, sort of obviously just by looking at the, the, the things that the plays are on the most obvious level about. Okay, what might connect those? Now, wherever there are human beings, there have to be some provisions for giving birth and rearing the young. Just think about the way in anthropology, uh, kin uh, kinship uh, in, in uh, ethnographies is so central. Now, the content, of course, varies enormously, although obviously male and female have to be involved, however minimally. Now, sexual generation is one sort of human making. Um, it's opposed to another sort of generation. The Greeks have a word from it, uh, for it, uh, techne. Our word technology comes from it. Uh, for them, it points to the various arts and crafts. So when you make a baby, you're engaged in a different kind of process than you're engaged in when you make a bookshelf. When you make a bookshelf, you go into it with a plan. You think, I need to do this, I need to do this, I need to do this in order to get the product. When you have sex, it's not usually uh, on your mind in that way. Even if you want to make a baby, you're not thinking about you know, how long the shelves have to be. Um, so techne as a mode of making seems much more under our control. It's interesting, creation myths tend to um, emphasize one of these two, one, one or the other of these two forms. So in Genesis, in the beginning, God makes the heaven and the earth. The earth is without form and void and the rest of it, but it looks as though it's a process of, uh, which is in a way akin uh, to techne. He see it's theogony, you have two gods at the beginning, Gaia and Oranos, heaven and earth, and they generate the second generation of gods. Now it's all interesting, but it does look as though um, if you think about what earth is, as soon as you have earth, you have heaven. You have something surrounding it. So it turns out that the togetherness of heaven and earth is already a done deal when you have one of them, but nevertheless, the model, the mythic model for, for uh, the generation of, uh, of the world is sexual in Hesiod, um, in the Theogony. Uh, but even in Genesis, you very quickly get a distinction between Cain and Abel. One farms, the other hunts. They're understood to be uh, I mean, the, one is a shepherd, the other is a farmer. They're understood to be very, very different from one another. And interestingly enough, Cain's ancestors, uh, and not his ancestors, his progeny, uh, go on to be the founders of cities. Now, even Aristotle, who's famous for arguing for the naturalness, naturalness of political life, um, even in Aristotle, cities are understood to be founded to be instituted, to be set up. They have a kind of techne feel to them. Um, they're matters of convention, of agreement, of nomos. Um, it looks as though the alternative to political society is the family understood as a natural social unit that one makes or generates, but doesn't choose or will. So family, and this is true even for us, stands for what is fundamental to our lives, but over which we have no control. It's somehow the inescapable. So it's not surprising that political philosophy has been preoccupied with it. It comes out in Republic Book Five and the first, the very first book of the politics in book six of um, chapter six of Locke's uh, um, 
uh, Second Treatise on Government, uh, second part, first and second part of Rousseau's Discourse on the Origins of Inequality. Marx's Communist Manifesto insists on the, uh, uh, on the overcoming of the family, uh, and uh, it's central to Hegel's uh, philosophy of right. So family, in some way, always resists the political. It resists rationalizing. So, you know, um, some of you have siblings. You love your siblings, I suppose. Um, have you ever dared to have, ask yourselves the question, if she weren't my sister, would I love her? Would I even like her? Doesn't mean that you don't like her. It means that, you know, it's sort of, it's unclear. The standards don't, are, are not, you don't choose your siblings. You love them because they are part of who you are in a way, but it's not the case that you would necessarily choose them if you could choose such things. So in that sense, family, uh, family is not something over which we have control. Now, Greek tragedy is obviously very much concerned with this issue. You just need to think about Antigone and Antigone's uh, decision to bury her brother despite the edict against uh, his being buried. Or put it really crudely, political life has within it the tendency to become comprehensive. Its goal is in a way the complete human good. But it can't ever obtain the autonomy that is built into it, that it wants, that it longs for, because it always has to rely for its supply of citizens on sexual procreation. It doesn't, you know, you can, you can make up the rules of government, but you can't make up citizens. You, you've got to get them from somewhere. So this process of sexual generation is something that ultimately resists techne, something that gives rise to loyalties of its own, either erotic loyalties or kinship loyalties, that resist being completely politicized. So the city, the polis, the political order, absolutely needs the family, and yet ultimately it wants to annihilate the family. In the Antigone, at one point, Creon's uh, son, Hymen, will warn him that he's becoming tyrannical, and Creon tells him that he should just obey him, um, and Hymen wonders why, and Creon says, you're my son, right? So the irony is that Creon is in the middle of asserting the primacy of the city, the political, over and against the family. And the reason he gives to his son for why he should uh, do what Creon wants him to do is because Creon's his father. That's not an ac accident. It turns out to be characteristic of political life to do something like this. It's, let's look at it by beginning with the political rather than with the familial. Political life is always organized around some understanding of justice. It doesn't have to be a correct understanding of justice, but however crude, there's always an understanding of justice at work. But any understanding of that kind is in principle universal. The law says it's wrong to kill, it's wrong to do this, it's wrong to, presumably that should mean it's wrong for anybody, anywhere to do these things. Under that understanding, however, it would be very hard to justify um, a particular law as an Athenian law, as opposed to a barbarian law, or an English law, as opposed to a French law. And yet political society is always particular. That would be true even if it were comprised of all existing human beings. And therefore, it looks as though political society, I'm not 
discovering this for the first time, as you'll see, um, political society is always founded in what you might call a crime. Not an accident that the founder of Rome is Romulus and Cain is the, um, the ancestor of the founders of cities in Genesis. What does it mean that political life is thought to begin with fratricide? The two most famous fratricides, Romulus on the one hand, Cain on the other. Well, to found a particular polis means somehow to kill your brother. To treat people who are the same as though they're fundamentally different, even though you do that so that you can treat some people as the same. The flip side of this problem is what's called autochthony. The myths about the origin of a particular society that suggests that we're, we naturally differ from others because we spring up from the ground as brothers and sisters. We spring from the same mother. And so we have words like motherland and fatherland. Um, the polis then tends to justify its non-universality uh, by making an analogy to the family. And therefore, on the one hand, it tries to suppress particular families and only grudgingly acknowledges them. And on the other hand, it can only justify itself as a sort of family and therefore has to suppress real families as a threat to its understanding of itself as a family. If you're everybody's brother, everybody's sibling in the city, then you're not supposed to treat um, your real siblings any differently from the way you treat everybody in the city. So the political order, pol the polis, is always a problematic mixture of the universal and the particular. That shows up within the polis um, because it understands itself as both natural and instituted. First paragraph of Aristotle's Politics. It shows up in the tension between the polis and the family, Antigone. It shows up in the tension within the family itself, as we'll see when we read it, Antigone as opposed to Ismini. Now, for reasons that aren't yet clear, these tensions, the polis, the family, the universal, the particular, techne, procreation, get articulated in Greek tragedy in terms of the distinction between male and female. This is, in a way, the most obvious distinction within humanity. Man and woman, he created them in his image. He created them, meant to be a puzzle, in a way. Um, in Greek, you have a word anthropos that means human being, and you have a word aner that means man, and gune that means woman. And the question is always what, um, what it means to be an anthropos. And yet, so in a way, Greek tragedy depends on understanding how this distinction is being articulated. It's a distinction we're very uncomfortable talking about. So the answer to why we spend a whole semester on Greek tragedy is that it asks fundamental questions in a way that unsettles us, in a way that forces us to take them seriously, even though in a way we don't want to take them seriously. Back a bit, something I wanted to say but forgot to say when I was talking about. So understanding what I mean by the, by the fact that Romulus and Cain are the paradigmatic uh, founders of cities, think about what Romulus does. Romulus. Um, takes a plow, and this is the man who killed his brother, Remus, and plows a furrow around the seven hills of Rome. And he says that everybody in the inside of that circuit is a Roman, and everybody in the outside 
is a foreigner. Um, when the Greeks make the distinction between Greek and barbarian, um, the notion of barbarian is thought by some to have come from this. Ba, 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 ba. And what is that? It's sort of like yada, 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 yada. It is a way of saying they're doing something with their mouths, but it doesn't make any sense. So it's an insistence that Greek is a language, and these other things that don't sound like language aren't language, which is a way of saying, it's a way of doing what, what Romulus does. It's a way of saying inside the circuit, you're a real human being. Outside the circuit, you're somehow not. Um, okay. Um, I want to turn very briefly, very briefly, to um, Aeschylus's Oresteia, which we'll start when we read the Agamemnon for next Wednesday, which reminds me, um, you should read the whole thing. It's the longest of the plays we'll read, about 1,800 lines. But um, read the whole thing so you have a sense of what happens, but then go back and read the first half of it. Um, we will spend two days on it. It's the shortest time we'll spend on any, on any play during the semester. So Aeschylus is Oresteia. Um, it's a trilogy. Um, the tragic festivals were entered when playwrights wrote not one play, but three plays. So originally, all of these plays were parts of trilogies. This is the only extant trilogy that we have. Uh, we'll start it on Wednesday. To back our way into it, we need a pre-plot summary. So there are brothers, Atreus and Thyestes. Thyestes sleeps with Atreus' wife. In revenge, Atreus feeds Thyestes most of his own children, of Thyestes' children. And Aegisthus is the only child who escapes. Um, Aegisthus then, in the next generation, sleeps with Agamemnon's wife, Clytemnestra, Agamemnon is the son of Atreus. Now, in order to go to war, in, this is the, Greek, the, the Trojan War, Agamemnon is told by an oracle that he has to sacrifice uh, his daughter Iphigenia. So he does that. And he goes off to Troy and he's gone for 10 years. At the beginning of the Agamemnon, he's returning to his home after 10 years uh, uh, returning from the war. Now, there are three very strange things about the trilogy. The, ag the language of the Agamemnon is incredibly lush. Uh, sometimes it's unintelligible, but it's gorgeous. The last play, the Eumenides, by the time we reach it, um, the language flattens out and becomes almost prosaic. That's the first strange thing. Second strange thing. Um, in the Agamemnon, the gods seem to be, at most, personifications of specific powers. So Hephaestus seems interchangeable with fire at uh, 280, line 281. Uh, the Furies seem more or less interchangeable with a kind of inner torment or guilt at line 463. So when we're told on line 60 um, that the chorus has this wonderful line, they say, uh, whoever Zeus may be, if this name is pleasing to him. Zeus, whatever he wants to be called. So they acknowledge that, in a way, they don't really know what they're talking about when they talk about the top god. 
But then this most interesting thing happens. Uh, at the very end of the libation bears, after he's killed his mother, Orestes kills Clytemnestra, um, he's talking to the chorus, and he announces that uh, he's being tormented by these inner uh, beings that are, that, and everybody says, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? Uh, you, you know, and your Orestes is about to run away. Um, the Furies are tormenting him, but he feels them, but nobody sees them. The play ends maybe 40 lines after that. Then you get the third play, the Eumenides, and it opens up when the priestess of Apollo at the, at the, um, at the temple of Apollo at Delphi runs out of the temple and gives you a description of what she's seen inside. And what she's seen inside is, on the one hand, identifiable as Orestes, who's gone to ask Apollo what to do. And then she gives a description of these awful old Gorgon-like hags that are surrounding him. So something rather interesting has happened between play two and play three. Invisible guilt has become visible. Nobody sees it at the end of the second play. There, it's visible to all at the beginning of the third play. That's the second weird thing. Um, third weird thing. It would be fair to say that this is a trilogy about justice um, in Greek, DK. Now, it means primarily DK, right or justice. Um, and from that, it has other meanings. It can mean trial. It can mean uh, penalty. It can mean a lawsuit. It can mean punishment. Um, and then it has one rather strange meaning. In the accusative case, for us, it would be the case in which a direct object um, uh, is used. Uh, in the accusative case, not DK, but decane, um, you add a, an N. It's also an ad adverb that means something like like or in the manner of. So it's in its way not quite the same, but sort of like the way we use just in English. You can, it can mean just having to do with justice, or it can just mean just in the way I just used it, right? Um, now, here's the distribution of DK in the three plays of the Oristia and in two other plays by Escorts. So the Agamemnon's about 1,700 lines. DK as just occurs 13 times. Decain, meaning like or in the manner of, occurs 14 times. In the Libation Bears, which is about 1,100 lines, DK as just occurs 14 times and DK Decane as like occurs 14 times. In the Eumenides, the last play, which is about 1,000 lines long, decay as just occurs 27 times. That's understandable because the Eumenides is all about the, the, a trial, and uh, just the word decay frequently means something like trial in, in the play. Decane as a uh, like occurs three times. In another Vescus plays, The Seven Against Thebes, DK as just occurs seven times and not at all uh, as like. And in the Prometheus Bound, uh, it doesn't occur in either sense. So it's much more frequent in general um, in the not only, it's not only much more fre frequent in general in the Oristia, um, which isn't so strange since the plays are about justice, but the adverbial sense of decain as like occurs more in the Agamemnon alone than in all the rest of Greek literature combined. So that's not a fluke. That's not, it'd be one thing if it was a little bit more, but no, more than in all of the rest of extant Greek literature combined, Aeschylus is highlighting the use of a word that is seldom used in the way in which he's using it. Now, remember, 
the three plays are a trilogy, and so they're written at exactly the same time, and so there's no development here. It's not as though the fact that it's present so little in the, uh, in the um, Eumenides um, relative to the Agamemnon is something that can be, you can say, well, Aeschylus just got tired of it and stopped using it. So what does that mean? You start with the notion perfectly, uh, perfectly defensible, a little empty as yet, but we'll try to fill it in, that the trilogy, if it's about anything, has to be about justice. Not hard to accept that since the humanities ends up with the founding of the Athenian jury system. That's what it's about. But this also seems somehow to do with the connection between justice and likeness, or justice and poetry, or justice and images. And this, in turn, has something to do with how we understand the gods, whether we understand them as persons or in some way as, um, as representations of natural things, Hephaestus and fire. So the interesting thing about the trilogy is that you start with an awareness of three oddities and you wonder whether you can think them together in such a way as to understand why they have to go together. So um, roughly speaking, you could put the problem in this way, half of the problem. Is there a necessary connection between poetry and justice? Not just in the in the Orstaya, but is there a necessary connection between poetry and justice everywhere and always? Think about it in this way, one way of backing into this. Um, I hate to do this. You know the, you know the basic story, right, that Priamnestra kills him when he comes home. Why does she kill him? This is a real question. Why does she kill Agamemnon? Anybody? Yeah. For good. But she's also been sleeping with Aegisthus for almost 10 years, right? And if Agamemnon comes back, presumably that'll have to stop, right? So she might do it because of revenge. She might do it because she prefers Aegisthus to Agamemnon. Um, what's she been doing for the last 10 years? Well, probably, but on the one hand, but in a more mundane way, she's been running the city. Not Aegisthus, but Clytemnestra. They start by talking about her. The chorus starts by talking about her. They call her a manly woman. They mean that to be a compliment, right? Um, and that also means they're afraid of her. So Agamemnon comes back. She won't be running things anymore. He'll be running things. Any of you remember what he brings back with him? Sorry? Sorry? Sorry. Yeah, and so his plan is to install her in the house along with um, Clytemnestra, and she might not like that idea. So just easy, I've got four motives. Her killing of Agamemnon is wildly overdetermined. Any one of these would be enough. It looks as though the, the, the notion of justice, as we're accustomed to getting it in legal proceedings, the desirable thing is to be able to get your hands on the motive. Not five motives, <laughs> the motive. And the question, I suppose, is this. Given what human beings are, can you ever get a hold of the motive? Do you ever know exactly what's going on in somebody's head? So it begins to look as though 
justice under the law requires that we think that we can get a hold of something and articulate what it is in a way that's far more satisfactory than we ever can. Doesn't mean, by the way, we shouldn't do it. But it may mean that in order to have a legal proceeding, you have to imagine that something is available to you that is in principle never simply available to you. And that would mean that you need, so there's something like poetry at work. So that may or may not be where we end up here, but you begin to see how, what it means to read these plays. What it means to read these plays is to notice these little weird things and then begin to wonder how, if they could be connected. How might they be connected? How might this, this, these things that look so out of place actually fit into a larger pattern that once you've understood, you've understood something that's going on at a very, at a very deep level? And what might that have to do with the gods? What I just articulated. So that's the way you've got to sort of get in the habit of reading, I think. Um, I've reached one of those points where I really should have something very big to say. And I think I'm pretty much done. So I don't have anything big to say. Um, questions about anything before we break? So read, I would say, all of it quickly, and then read, say, the first 900 lines, and uh, read them more carefully. <laughs>